for something where it's extraordinary outcome if it works, but it might be long odds. So I'm okay if, if most people in the world would say this isn't gonna work. But if it works, and it's really big if it works, I'm all over it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be your host today. My name is Katie Russell, and I'm the co-founder and managing director at Draper Startup Pass Accelerator, where we invest up to $100,000 in extraordinary pre-seed founders with industry transforming companies. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a, I'd like to give a big thank you to my team, Daniel Wiegand and Summer Vaughn, who are in the back end, making sure everything runs smoothly and who have put on this entire program the past month. For those of you tuning in today who are not familiar with Draper Startup House, we invest in 20 companies per year across all industries and put them through a one month in-person training in Austin, Texas. During this time, the founders live together under one roof in our properties while they attend workshops, build their networks and learn from industry leaders. At the end of our session, our founders are more prepared than ever to go raise a true seed round. We're currently accepting applications to our 2020 three programs, um, you can apply at dshaccelerator.com. If you are a founder who is not ready for investment, but still want to experience living with other founders from all around the world, you can check out our co-living option on Friday. So this Friday, when our startup co-living beta launches, we'll have tons of houses to choose from and the houses will be curated based on industry, startup stage, location, and so forth. If you want to be added to our launch announcement, you can shoot me an email to katie at draperstartuphouse.com. Before I introduce our panelists for today, we're going to do a quick run through of how the stocks platform works. So it's pretty straightforward. If you have a question for the startup while they're pitching, you can put it in the chat and one of their team members will be there to answer it for you. If you want to take the conversation offline with the startup, you simply click the request an intro button. Now I want to introduce our panelists for today, Matt Harris. Matt is on the investment team at Draper Associates. Prior to launching or prior to joining Draper Associates, Matt was a vice president at the Blackstone Group, where he focused on providing growth financing to energy companies all over the world. Matt has a bachelor's degree in finance from Texas A&M University and is a term member on the Council of Foreign Relations. He is based in Austin, Texas, where he lives with his wife and three daughters. Fun fact about Matt is that he knew modeled in college and was mistakenly wanted for Grand Theft Auto. So Matt, before we begin, do you have any words of wisdom for the founders or maybe advice on how not to be mistakenly wanted for Grand Theft Auto before we begin? That, that's a long story. Um, and, I, and I got paid for the nude modeling. So if you, so if you, have, you have a friend that is a professional nude model, just so you know. Um, the, uh, yeah, so I'm Matt Harris. Uh, I'm, I'm on the investment team at Draper Associates. Uh, we invest in crazy teams, or sorry, crazy ideas and crazy teams, crazy ideas and great teams at the at the very earliest stages, uh, because it's crazy ideas and great people that that protect and promote freedom, and that's what we're all about. And so, if you're if you're um, if you have a great team and a crazy idea, then then come to us. You can uh, Matt at Draper.vc. Uh, I'm based here in Austin with Katie and Daniel, and they're they're doing a great job uh, with their with their incubator, and it's it's really a direct shot at at, at um, our firm and several other top tier VC firms. So really happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Matt. Well, the structure for today will be three minute pitches from four founders, followed by five to 10 minutes of Q&A from Matt. So let's begin. Our first founder pitching today is Garrett McCurrock, who has quite the pipe dream for changing the logistics industry. Let's welcome Garrett with Pipe Dream. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, yeah, here at Pipe Dream, uh, we started Pipe Dream because our goal was to make 30 second delivery times possible this decade, which is a crazy goal, but it, it made us really think about what is missing from the ecosystem today that is going to eventually enable 30 second delivery time. So we looked in a lot of places. Um, we have a lot of background in, in robotics, drones, uh, self-driving cars, so on. And as we we're looking through those, we realized, you know, what really is missing is kind of that base layer infrastructure uh, that can power uh, the longer, faster um, distances that you need to cover in a city. And after some diligence process, we realized that might need to be underground pipes. So uh, Pipe Dream, what we're doing is we're uh, putting in a network of underground pipes, very similar to sewage and water, uh, that will eventually 
power the network that will deliver 30 second delivery times to cities. Uh, what is pipe dream? Yeah, we're going through this, the same 14 to 20 inch pipes that water and sewage go through um, to eventually deliver things to homes and businesses. Right now, that's going to be uh, to our own portals, which you see here in the picture. Uh, but eventually, that's going to go uh, into homes and businesses and apartment buildings. Uh, the way that it works is you place an order on any platform, just like you would normally do through your phone. And then we are just powering that uh, fulfillment methods uh, intra-city delivery. So how it goes from one point in the city to another point. Uh, and then it gets delivered to your home exactly in the same way. So you don't need to go somewhere to pick it up. You don't have to walk down the street and pick it up. It's still going to get delivered. We are just making that delivery faster and cheaper. Uh, the way that we make the, uh, the PVC or HTTP pipes um, work is with the pod. And the reason that, that we're putting all the technology into the pod is because to develop this network, you want to make your per foot installation cost as cheap as possible. So that's why we're using just the same PVC HTTP as sewage and water because um, they're easy to put in, they're cheap to put in, and cities know how to put those into their easements. But that means all the technology needs to go into the pod. So the pod is a self-navigating robot that can traverse those tubes and its tote size is designed for a small grocery order uh, so that if you have a larger order, you can do multiple pods, but it can at least fit most grocery items. Uh, the network that we're developing is an intra-city network that goes between neighborhoods and districts. Um, and that comes up to a portal. And the portal eventually will be designed to interface with other autonomous methods. Uh, but for right now, that's gonna interface just directly with uh, couriers. Uh, our roadmap right now is focused on a year from now, building out the first city scale network. Uh, but right now we're about to finish construction on our first small scale network in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that network is gonna go from inside a store to inside an office building and traverse about a mile long uh, stretch. And that should complete given uh, construction timelines in, in the next few weeks. Uh, eventually, we're going to have a full city network. Uh, we're going to have a full city network in, in most cities. Uh, and the goal is to have the first one come online uh, a year from now. Uh, the payback model on that is um, it, it's going to cost us some money to put it in. But the goal is to have a payback model in the next five years. We think while aggressive, it's doable and will help us scale to a lot of cities faster. Uh, we grew a great team. Uh, I, I can't believe we have the team that we have. Um, I'll, I'll spare you reading the names, um, but I, we really enjoyed uh, working with Katie and Daniel. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Good to see you, Garrett. Uh, like really cool. That's a big swing there. What, uh, what, why do you care about this? What made you want to do this? Yeah. So when we were looking at like the goal of Pipe Dream was like, we need to take a 10 year bet and like, lock into an idea that we care so passionately about that if we fail for 10 years, it's like, we'll be fine. It's, it's not going to like affect us emotionally to like wallow in the swamp failing for 10 years. And the reason we pick last mile logistics is we have always felt that last mile logistics holds back how great uh, commerce can be right now. Like consumerism is, is a net negative thing. Like we just consume and we throw away and, and we have a circular economy. It just is really destructive. You know, we buy something, I sort of my home, and eventually I'm going to, you know, give it to a truck that's going to take it to a landfill and just dump it in a pile. Um, as we make last mile logistics quicker and uh, closer to the person, not only does that mean great stuff for delivering items to people and give people more access to more things, it also makes reverse logistics really easy. So there doesn't have to be, you know, consumerism isn't predicated on purchasing things, using it and disposing. It could be a much more circular cycle where you, but you really just like rent something, have it sent to you, use it for the time you want to use it, and then just send it back. Um, and that that interaction is a, is a known thing that's going to happen. It's just like 20, 30 years in the future. So our goal is like, if we can make that happen as soon as possible, the things you can build on top of that and what that means for society is huge. So that's what uh, gets us going. Yep. And what do you think early on, like for the Atlanta pipeline, what are, what are people going to use it most for, you think? Yeah, so it's, it's going to be for food and grocery and convenience items uh, initially. That office park, um, there's about 8,000 people kind of in that office park. Uh, so the the restaurant center that we're going from is the busiest uh, in Georgia. So um, it's super tough to get out there and get food. So they'll, they'll just be delivering food. Uh, cool thing is we're going all the way into one of the office buildings, but we'll also transfer to uh, sidewalk robots to go to the other office buildings in the park. Oh, very cool. 
And when I think infrastructure, I think, you know, regulations, permitting, you know, kind of an established fleet of installation companies and distribute equipment distributors. How do you navigate all that? Like, what is, how does this get into the permitting process? Like, do regulations have to change for you to be a big company? Yeah. So we, we've actually like, since we're kind of predicated on scale, like we're really looking at scale. That's why we're using this, those PVC and HDPV uh, tubes, very similar to other utilities. And the interesting thing is in the Atlanta pilot, um, when we, when we're getting the permitting for the store, it's going to take three months. So the store we're putting in is has a three month permitting timeline. Everyone's like, Oh, that's pretty quick for something above ground. Uh, we got the permits for the underground portion, uh, in a week <laughs> going into a building and into a store. It's just like, we live in two worlds of permitting one that exists above ground and one that exists below ground, especially in city easements. Um, the permitting process is, is a lot easier. And if you think about like, the logical reasons why we didn't realize this till, you know, uh, about a year ago is the logical reasons is like, there's a lot of stuff that can impact city life when it's doing above ground health, safety, um, housing costs, but underground is pretty much shielded from all that. Can't really hurt anybody. Uh, you know, there's almost infinite space down there. <laughs> um, so the city's really aligned to, to get you those permits. I, I will say it's a small sample size of our experience so far. Sure. And there are going to be, you know, extra sensitivities as, as we continue to scale. Uh, but so far the experience has been, uh, profoundly easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what is the mechanism through which the groceries and convenience items move and what happens if they get stuck? Like what is the process? What, how do you fix that problem? Yeah. So, so our pods are, and this is one of the reasons we brought uh, McAllister Higgins who co-founded Voyage, the self-driving car company on the team is we really want those pods to be as smart and as problem solving as possible. Uh, the good news is you can kind of just like, there's two things to do underground is you can go forwards or backwards. <laughs> so when a pod gets stuck, um, it's just going to send a distress signal to the network and the pod behind it is going to slow down, butt up against it. And then the pods are designed that no matter how they fail, they can still roll through the network. So it's just going to come up and almost like a, a reverse tow truck, just push it through the network uh, to a deposit point. Yeah, really cool. And how far, did you say how far down the pipes will be? Will that be standard or will it be different everywhere? Standard utility layer. Um, so it's a little different everywhere, but most places are six to 12 feet. Cool. And follow up with me. I have a technology you might want to license or, or have somebody licensed to help you figure out where the stuff is before you. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's like, oh, so yeah, yeah, sorry. Not, not, not to jump in. <laughs> early. But yeah, that'd be awesome. GPR is like super cool, but it's still so early. Um, so I'm excited to hear what it is. Yeah. Um, very cool. Um, and did you say how much you're trying to raise at the end there? Did I, did I miss that? Yeah, so so we're we're about um, we've raised four and a half million on our seed round, and we have about two million uh, left uh, okay. on that seed round. Yeah. Um, trying to reserve that for strategic capital. Yeah, so that that was, so the six million. So that's where the six million to do the whole Atlanta project came in. It's like, it's you know that plus a little padding, I guess, is the. So the Atlanta project is actually um, a little uh, under a million. Um, the rest of that is just to build out our sales process and start getting into more cities. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I saw you last week and also your hair looks really good. I, know I love <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> good to see you, Matt. Good to see you. Uh, Garrett, what happens if the robots get stuck? I asked that. Uh, Did you? Yeah. Oh, I totally missed it. Okay. <laughs> like, I was getting distracted by Matt's hair too. So I, was I, need, a I need a haircut. I, need, I, can't, I, I can't find it. I was like, I don't think I heard that question, but um, <laughs> great. Okay. Well, great job, Garrett. Thank you, Matt. We'll move on to the next person. All right, so let's meet Naman from Airbound. Fun fact, this is a Naman's first time in the US and is the youngest founder that DSH Accelerator has ever invested in. So take it away, Airbound. Hey, uh, so I'm Naman, I'm the co-founder of Airbound and what we're doing is building the largest network of delivery drones across the world. So the key problem that we're trying to solve is that infrastructure is broken um, in rural parts of the world, and I mean, in India alone, over 500,000 hospitals are facing the issue of not getting deliveries in time. It can take, you know, up to three days for them to get their medications and, uh, you know, other essential deliveries. And on top of that, it's just prohibitively expensive. You know, these hospitals can afford less, but it also costs 20 times more than in tier one cities. So... We believe that drones can solve this problem, but the way the drone delivery industry is currently, no company is really um, set to be able to ta tackle this market. And that's because 
a solution requires a couple of key things. So delivery drones are not like the kind of drones that you play around with. They're not like quadcopters. They're more like miniaturized airplanes. So they require a lot of infrastructure for takeoff and landing. And that's a problem that nobody's really been able to solve. Uh, people are moving towards vertical takeoff drones, but even then they require entire warehouses, uh, which is really difficult. So we've listed out the key things that are required to make a solution like this possible and make something that works for the rural market. And we've built it as well. So this is a design that we made. It's the world's first blender wing body tail sitter. And as you can see, you know, we spent a lot of time engineering this and it's allowed us to create something that's an order of magnitude lighter, smaller, and still has a range that's 10x longer. And the cargo capacity is one kilogram, which is enough for majority of medical deliveries and delivery of blood. So again, as you can see, you know, we're really one of a kind. No other delivery company has been able to achieve the same specs as us. And that's why we're uniquely positioned to tackle this market. And, you know, we've already made progress on this. Uh, we're looking to start deliveries very soon uh, around the end of this year. We've closed a paid contract with a hospital in a tiger reserve in India. So they're facing severe issues with deliveries and they're re really excited to have us on board. We're also quite close to closing Rotary Club, which owns 90% uh, of the blood banks in India. And we're also looking at, you know, a lot of companies to close in the future. You know, we've had talks with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Walmart, et cetera. And, you know, once we have a successful pilot program, uh, we'll be able to look at uh, working with them. And this is really our vision. You know, we want this to expand beyond just medical deliveries. We want to essentially be the delivery network for the rural market. We want to make drone delivery as easy as booking an Uber. So you simply take the app, you call an airbound drone, you load up the package, you input the destination, and that's it. There's nothing more to it. And any small business can now engage in drone delivery. Uh, we're really looking to transform a global market. You know, the rural market is huge. In India alone, there's 900 million people who live in rural areas. This number jumps to 3.4 billion globally. And $50 billion is, an is spent annually on the delivery of on-demand medical supplies. So this is purely emergency deliveries. And it's not just us who believes in this. You know, there are a lot of organizations who do believe in us and they believe in us because of who we are. You know, we've shown that we have the expertise to build this and to find a market for this. We've designed, built and flown this drone completely from scratch. And uh, along with that, you know, we have a team of talented advisors who are giving us their expertise and their valuable time to help make this a reality. So we're looking to raise, you know, about three million for a seed round. This money would let us build an amazing team, uh, which will let us implement our pilot program and start generating revenue, which we're hopefully looking to scale to about a million ARR before we then look to raise our Series A. Very cool. So what's your story? Like, what um, did something happen that made you realize that this was a this was a big problem, or like, what 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 is it that made this something you really wanted to go tackle? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, for me, I was actually never really interested in drone delivery. You know, I always thought of it as just the next step for consumerism. You get your Amazon deliveries faster and it wasn't something that I was particularly interested in. But I saw a video on Zipline. So Zipline actually does blood delivery uh, in Rwanda and Ghana. And I thought that was really cool because I realized that, you know, medical deliveries is something where time is not just a matter of convenience. It can save lives. And that's where it's way more valuable for drones to do than any other kind of delivery. So I thought what Zipline was doing was really great, but I felt like there was a fundamental flaw. You know, they required an insane amount of infrastructure. They need a literal rail gun to launch their drones and a bungee cord system for them to land. And this would work for, you know, small countries. You set up a tower, uh, you can get full national coverage with two or three, uh, but in a place like India, you know, it's huge and most parts of the world are huge. And that means that their delivery model just can't work for the rural market. It can't work for sparsely populated areas. And then, you know, I did more research and realized that that's the same story for every single drone delivery company. It doesn't work. So, you know, I figured that this is a huge issue and it's something that I really wanted to solve. So, you know, I decided to just go for it. Yeah. And I mean, Zipline is like a, they're a su successful business that have, has, you know, achieved high valuations, right? I haven't looked at them, but right now. Yeah. So what yeah. is their problem? So what do you think their problem is? I haven't ever looked at them, but say that again. What? Why can't they? Okay. So, so they're really good at what they do, but I don't think they can, you know, expand as fast as we have the potential to. Because if you need to build a multi-million dollar warehouse to simply do delivery in a hundred kilometer range, that inherently becomes limiting. You know, you can't scale to all of India. You can't scale to all of the U.S. You can't scale to all of the world 
you're limited to you know densely populated areas and you know that makes that means that there are so many people out there who never get access to drone delivery so we're trying to fill that gap got it and and you said that no none of these guys have been able to achieve the specs that you guys have what, what is that uh, has there been some technology breakthrough or is it, is it, the, is it team related or why is it that you guys have made the breakthrough? Yeah. So it's definitely on the tech side, you know, we've, we've sort of done a crazy amount of research. We spent the past two years building this frame. Um, so we've really looked at sort of combining a lot of concepts that you see. So, you know, this is based off of a theoretical blended wing body design that Boeing's come up with that they're looking to launch uh, for the passenger planes, you know, in the coming couple of decades. Uh, this is based on, you know, tail sitter model, which is um, relatively, it's not seen as much. It's pretty difficult to sort of get it working. But if you do, that means there's no extra components required for vertical takeoff. So let's say most companies, they essentially have their drones take off vertically and then fly horizontally. But that means the vertical takeoff propellers uh, just add a crazy amount of drag and that it becomes very limiting for the range. Whereas we take off like this and transition and fly horizontally. So yeah, it's a completely novel frame. Um, and yeah, it's a deck that really makes us. Yeah. Different. Very cool. And what is the energy source for these? Um, I'm just thinking, you know, it's pretty heavy. It's long distances. Does it do it? Does electric work for this or do you need diesel or what, 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 what do you electric, guys do? Electric is definitely the best. So currently we're using a mixture of lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries, but we're working on making our custom battery pack. Oh, very cool. And I think, I think you said you guys, you guys make all this, everything is in house so far yeah and there's Starting out of my bedroom um moved to like the small workshop and now you know after this round we're looking to sort of uh create a full manufacturing setup yeah. and who so who's the who's the actual customer who pays for the service right so this is where you know we're reaching out to uh these large organizations who um sort of control the hospital so in india you don't have a lot of hospitals that work independently so that's why for instance we're talking to rotary club they own 70 percent of the blood banks and uh, they would sort of be paying for these because in the rural market, a lot of people can't afford medical services. So these are all paid for by other charitable organizations or the government. So we're directly going to those high levels and uh, you know, that's who will be paying us. Very cool. Um, and then you may have touched on this, but like, it seems like it could be used for a lot more than just healthcare related things, right? What are you guys thinking long-term? Definitely. So, I mean, I think long term, our vision is to essentially connect up the rural world. We want interconnectivity in uh, rural parts of the world to be as good as urban. You know, I mean, living in an urban city, I've lived in an urban city my whole life. It's been really easy to get access to whatever I want to. There's always a store nearby. Amazon deliveries work great. But that's just not the same story for people living in villages. So, you know, we believe if we can get that level of connectivity to them, just the access to opportunities would be insane. And it would, you know, be sort of an innovation explosion because the rural market is really huge and most people don't realize that. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then you're raising 3 million. Um, and what did, what did you say you're going to use the money for? Right. So we're going to use the money to set up a manufacturing base and hire an amazing team, which will allow us to, you know, do a pilot program, start generating revenue, scale to about 1 million ARR. Very cool. Which, where are you based? Where's the company based? So we're based out of Bangalore, India. I've, I spent a summer in Bangalore in college. Uh, one of my one of my really good friends is an entrepreneur in India that I think has is doing something similar with not not drone related, but trying to connect rural markets. Um, oh, love to connect with, with that. specifically farmers. So let's let's chat about that, and I can introduce you. Yeah, sounds great. Awesome, really important company, man. Good work. Great, fantastic job, Naman. For our next startup, we have Rajesh from Two Twelve. So if you're a startup founder yourself, this is one pitch that you'll make you want to make sure you listen to. Uh, so the stage is yours, Rajesh. Thank you so much, uh, Kitty. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I am uh, the co-founder at 212. We are a cap table and fund administration company. So the first question uh, for you would be, okay, why do you need another cap table fund admin company when you already have Kata, Captable.io, Shareworks, and 50 other copycats? Uh, the big difference uh, for us is combined, these companies own less than 5% of the startup ecosystem. Our customers are, uh, let me switch here. Our customers are the 95% of the founders that are managing their cap table on spreadsheets. Uh, what these founders quickly recognize is that uh, these uh, spreadsheets become very expensive because they need to bring in their lawyers and accountants to manage and operate. 
just becomes super boring. And we have found so many mistakes as we have onboarded a lot of our customers. The math is absolutely wrong. The big challenge here uh, for a lot of the startup founders is there's absolutely no automation. There are so many companies out there that brings a UI on top of a spreadsheet uh, and try to uh, uh, give a lot of freemium products to founders. But very quickly, founders recognize that when they add their 26 shareholder or they add a dollar more than a million dollars they've raised, uh, they get screwed uh, royally by uh, getting a massive bill. Uh, this is a problem uh, for more than 1.5 million founders just in the United States. And uh, what we have looked at uh, this problem and uh, we said, okay, there's going to be uh, uh, companies that will have pre-money saves, post-money saves, convertible nodes, price round, liquidation preferences, pro rata. Uh, it just gets very, very complicated that even the smartest accountants or lawyers are just not able to keep up uh, with understanding and building performers. And that's really what we have done. We basically solve that complex math. And uh, we've been in, uh, in service since uh, January of last year. We have onboarded uh, more than 400 founders all the way from pre-seed through CDC with zero marketing spend. And these founders are managing more than $300 million in equity from over 10,000 investors on the total platform. The best part is just $240 per year and it's unlimited everything. And the reason we can do this at $240 a year is because it's 100% automated. And at 240 bucks, we still make about 85% margin on this product. What, uh, the, uh, what the connected API enabled cap table allows us to do is go generate other revenue streams. So one of them is fund administration and Bolt is one of our marquee customers that we brought in. So uh, Bolt uh, today, they have to spend about three months waiting for their accounting statements to show up and, uh, and Dave spends multiple weeks fixing uh, broken spreadsheets. With us, it's 100% accurate and real time. Our next steps is basically start using these uh, uh, data that we have and, and build uh, business intelligence for both uh, founders and investors. Uh, we acquired an SPV business uh, this week and that was primarily driven by angel syndicates and uh, capital allocators coming to us wanting 212 to power their invest now button. Uh, we are a team of experienced uh, uh, startup operators. Uh, we have known uh, each other for several years now. We have started businesses before, scaled and exited uh, them. So we really know what we're doing here. Uh, in conclusion, we are really automating a lot of the uh, critical pieces of the startup ecosystem. We've already done that with cap table, with valuations, uh, with liquidity, with uh, transfer agent services. And as investors, most of the investors are uh, investing in disruptive technologies, but they continue to manage their equity using outdated spreadsheets and uh, emails and lawyers and accountants and uh, systems that don't talk to each other. Now, if you are one of the investors that uh, would like to support a team that is building the rails that connect and bring these uh, startup ecosystems to the next generation, come talk to us at uh, hello212.co. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah, I, uh, I end up building my own cap tables for the investments we make a lot of the time just to make yep. sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's popping out the right way on their side and all the numbers are right. And it is, it is hard <laughs> to, it is. to deal no, with all, no, the, it, all the moving pieces of startup cap tables. That's correct. Imagine <laughs> you give your spreadsheet to somebody else and then they're sending it back to you. Do like you yeah, trust that yeah. anymore? So very cool. Um, what, what do you think the reason is that, you know, like Carta and these companies have stayed kind of up market and at a higher price? Like, do you think there are any take, like, do you think there's a reason they haven't moved? Like, what are the lessons there that you're... That you're so, so to me, it's all about the automation, right? So like you said, uh, when, when, uh, it's, it's a very complex problem to solve. Uh, there's a lot of math equation. You give, get PTSD if you're not a number file. So, uh, so that's uh, to us, it's really... Uh, uh, it's it's not automated. They haven't brought it up to the uh, the latest uh, technologies that are available and how you can build a scalable solution. So uh, that that's that, that's really what we find is the biggest challenge. We have tried to analyze some of our competitors in the space, um, uh, like to really geek out on the technology. What they do is they bring a lot of the tech to the front end on the browser, so they're limited by how much browser math uh, can uh, can be done on the browser side. Uh, but uh, for us, we put everything on the Amazon cloud. So we have infinite uh, compute resources to do all the math. So we can model out any type of uh, scenarios. Very cool. And yeah, the 240 a year price point is is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, That's great. The uh, what, how does, um how does like what a founder, so say it's like a, you know, 
pre-seed stage company. Um, it's just it's just two people, you know, no no finance background. What do they have to do to onboard to your to your product versus? Oh, so for us, uh, because this is a math problem, so we want to make sure that the input is correct. If you have garbage in, you get garbage out. So what we have done as part of the two forty dollars is we offer free onboarding, the free onboarding and free audit uh, as as part of that. So you you can even be like a series C company, which uh, we have quite a few of. So as part of the onboarding, uh, we also do a lot of audits. So we check to make sure did the documents match or did they issue more shares. Uh, then uh, they have authorized. So we immediately catch all these problems and they're able to fix it. So two founders uh, starting up, yeah, it's super easy. They come uh, sign up with us and we talk to them and get them set up uh, within within 30 seconds. And so like how scalable is all that today? Like, is that all automated today? Yes, it's 100% automated. Everything's automated. Wow, very cool. And then how, you, how many... Um... Founders, did you like what, talk talk a little more about market size? And and it's, I oh, guess you're not targeting just the earliest stage startups, but really that's really correct. All. So so we looked at uh, we looked at how many C corps are there in the U.S. and uh, and we looked at the IRS tax filing, and we see that there are more than 1.5 million founders, and that's growing at about two percent uh, year over year. But we also have uh, companies that are worldwide. So we have about seven countries uh, founders across seven countries using our platform. So the market is massive. But just in the U.S., if you look at only the C-Corp, there's 1.5. But we also support LLCs, and there are a lot more LLCs. Like, the number is just massive. Uh, so that's why I don't even talk about it, because some of the LLCs are just whatever, one-person um, um, laundry business. But uh, but there are a lot of serious companies, uh, uh, like Sigma Sense, as an example, uh, that's Austin-based. That's a massive LLC. Uh, they use 212, and they pay 240 bucks. Yeah, very cool. And so how did like you talked a little bit about you know what um, how many products cap table management software can turn into? Um, oh yeah, which, yeah, it's a big a big deal. So how do uh, you good good? I was just gonna say like there, like like you said in the beginning there are a lot of companies in the space and so like how do you how do you think you may not want maybe you don't want to say this in front of everybody so tell me to go away if so but like how do you think about protecting your business when when you know once um, you know. Carta and them notice what you're doing and they move towards you? Like, what can you do to keep them away? Oh, we, we already see them noticing. So we see a lot of uh, Carta folks looking at our LinkedIn profile. So we, we, we have no problems with that. So so for us, uh, we fundamentally changed how we build the startup, uh, the the cap table piece. Uh, and and to us, uh, we really want uh, Carta and others to try it, all right? And uh, so, so maybe they can... Uh, uh, bring down the price uh, that they charge their customers from ten thousand to hundred thousand uh, dollars, and bring it down to two forty bucks. We we totally encourage that. Uh, uh, for us, uh, the the complexity is in in building solutions that are scalable, that are API centric, and that you don't get from um, just coming up and taking a lot of tech deficit. Uh, and and that's been my background. I build large scalable solutions uh, for three letter agencies in the United States. Um, so we just bring a lot of these kind of experience to. Uh, to to be the first in the market uh, with this solution, so we can uh, be we can just scale out uh, very quickly now. Yeah, very cool. And what is the what marketing channels are you finding to be the best ones? Uh, well, interestingly, we haven't done any marketing, so that's the beauty of uh, what we've done. So we just uh, so young, uh, uh, who's our chief operating officer, he scaled uh, businesses all the way from C to CDC for Phil's Coffee, Limelight, Journey, and several other businesses. So he's now starting the engine uh, to basically get us in front of uh, uh, different customers. And uh, we are now on path to add at least uh, around 40 new startups every week uh, within the next uh, three to four months uh, once we close this round. So how is that happening though? Like, is there something viral built into the product or how? Yeah, you- it's basically, he's got, uh, he's got a very interesting uh, um, uh, way of uh, building that framework of uh, getting digital footprints on the market and then... Uh, uh, and then spending on marketing to get uh, more eyeballs. Uh, um, so it's it's a process that is done and repeated and tested. Yeah. So he's just going to apply that uh, to 212. Yeah, that seems like the key, right? Because it sounds like you've got the best oh, product at the yeah, lowest price. We, so you just got to get you gotta get it out there. At a... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Very cool. And you said you're uh, raising, say, say again, tell us again uh, about the raise. Uh, we're raising two million. So we've raised so far about one point seven million, uh, and that's uh, that's because we we were only raising what we needed to get to this point. And now that uh, we feel very confident about our new SPV acquisition and uh, and all the channels that uh, now we can go and capture, 
uh, we are raising $2 million at a $24 million uh, pre-money. Awesome. Great. Really cool. Can't wait to tell our founders about uh, it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Great job, Rajesh. Uh, for thanks, our man. last pitch, let's welcome Miguel from Felion Aerospace, whose company is out of this world. Take it away, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Let's see here. So uh, I'm Miguel Ayala, CEO of Affiliate Aerospace. I'm an aerospace engineer. Uh, we are developing taxi services to space powered with proprietary green propulsion technology. One second. Um, so small spacecraft launch is on average about four times more expensive than the spacecraft itself. On top of that, the, um, the space launch overall is an extremely lengthy process. It can take anywhere from one to six years to go from contract to launch. This is mainly because of hazardous chemicals being used, making manufacturing and operations uh, extremely complex. Also, rideshare services intended to carry several dozens of spacecraft at a time require a tremendous level of effort and numerous people to coordinate. Now, uh, our solution is, is a small built vehicle for dedicated door-to-door -door taxi service. Where SpaceX and others are building giant buses to space, we're building little taxis to space. The, um, the way we're different is with our key propulsion technology, with our propulsion technology that's green. It can be produced from biofuels. It's carbon neutral. It has seven years of R&D already completed by Sandia National Labs and, and then that's it can power rockets, satellites, moon landers. It has numerous benefits, especially much simpler safety procedures, meaning we can move through the manufacturing and operations process much faster and more affordably. Also, minimal environmental restrictions, meaning we can launch from any open space with approved use of the airspace. And it has several potential applications on Earth, like uh, airplanes, boats, cars, trucks, you name it. Now, with uh, the, in the end, the benefit of what we're doing is um, we can reduce launch lead time from one to six years to within one month, then eventually within one week. This will greatly, greatly enable our commercial customers generate revenue much faster and our government customers address threats much more rapidly. Our CTO, Matthew Travis and I, Um, we have decades of experience developing launch vehicles and spacecraft. In our team, we have over 20 people. We have 20 people of, um, from NASA and top aerospace companies. Also, our advisors are champions in the growth of the space industry. Now, compared to our competitors, we are the only ones using a green propulsion technology that uh, greatly simplifies and increases launch locations. Now, yeah, thanks to what we what we've been doing, we've been actually um, engaging sixty with uh, sixty plus potential customers already, and so far we have already secured fifteen million plus in contracts. In addition, uh, we have a massive growing pipeline in future business. Now, to address this demand, we have um, are we raising twenty million dollars uh, for a twenty four month runway for launch vehicle development and manufacturing and sales. This is, uh, this, is, this is definitely rocket science in a nutshell. I'm happy to elaborate on any of this information. Uh, what questions can I answer at this time? Awesome. There's so much going on in space. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's crazy. It's exciting. I mean, I feel like every, every, every um, major problem on Earth is being addressed by something in space, which is like really exciting. Um, For sure. yep. I feel like I'm just starting to get my arms around it. Um, all right, so you're raising 20, going big. Um, tell me what you're going to use the money for. Uh, so it's mainly to uh, to get to, to fully develop our launch vehicles. We are we're, we're working on suborbital vehicles that we can start launching as, uh, as soon as uh, later this year, and definitely start operating next year. Uh, and then in two years, we're looking at starting our orbital launch operations. So the 20 million will get us. Um, pretty close to having a fully developed uh, orbital launch vehicle. Uh, at that point, we'll have to race again to um, to, to conduct some uh, orbital launch tests uh, 
and uh, and also to start scaling production. But and, and up up until then, we uh, twenty million is twenty million gets pretty far. Got it. Um, and so so you're so part of the money is to develop the the system. Uh, do do you have you gotten any um, government contract like government grants or, or milestone based contracts for this yet? Uh, not yet. However, we are aggressively pursuing government um, uh, funds through through DOD, NASA, mm -hmm. NSF, and even um, looking at opportunities at DOE, Department of, uh, of Energy. Uh, we uh, we have submitted a proposal to NSF. We're waiting to hear back. Uh, we should find out next month. And uh, right at this moment, um, uh, we are actually drafting four proposals, two to NASA, one to DOD, and uh, one to the state of Colorado. Uh, the state of Colorado has some grants available for oh. uh, for something like this. Awesome. And what what is the the TRL for the system so far? The technological readiness level. You guys have that. Yes. Yes. So the most critical technology here, the, our most uh, our biggest uh, disruptive advantage is our propulsion technology, and that is at TRL seven, meaning we have a full full scale uh, engine uh, built and tested, and then um, in um, in a few months we're going to be launching that. Uh, launching a suborbital rocket powered with that engine. So after that launch, uh, we'll be at TRL-8, which means uh, almost ready for market. And then after that, uh, yep. so mm -hmm. we should be at TRL-9 after that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Just for people listening, 10, 10 is the highest. That means that, you know. Nine, nine is the highest, sorry. Oh, nine is the highest, oh, sorry. Good to know, good to know. <laughs> uh, I was going to say nine's pretty good. Apparently yeah. it's the best. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, so you said, and you said 50 million in contracts um talk to us about that those yeah so we have so right now we have uh, we have 15, uh, 15 million dollars in contracts um 10 million of that is for it's actually for uh, uh, for little miniature satellite products um we're working with uh, with an ed tech company that uh that's working on on a, STEM, on a global stem project and um, we were looking for a way to generate revenue early and we had the expertise to build these little satellites so so we, we went in there to you know to generate the revenue early. Also, we have a five million dollar contract uh, to develop uh, propulsion systems for one of the NASA, one of uh, NASA's moon lander providers. And oh. um, yeah, very cool. And what is uh, is there a way to explain to a dumb finance guy like what uh, what it is that's being patented? Like what's what's the breakthrough that you've made? Sure. So the the most important. Uh, thing is the is the chemical formulation of our fuel, that um, that drives everything. And so we're going to be patenting that, and then we're going to be patenting uh, uh, like the the, the, the process um, of um, of the propulsion process, the uh, then the different applications for this fuel. Because as we're seeing, um, this is new information here. As, as we are you know doing more research, we're, we're finding out that our fuel is applicable for to power you know other things like uh, like cars, boats, airplanes, things like that. Yeah, and 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 you talked about this in the beginning, but just to, to rehash it now that I actually understood that, uh, sure. very common. Uh, what what are all the benefits of of your new chemical formulation and new propulsion process? I know it's green, so that's one benefit. Mm -hmm. Is it talk about the other benefits? Yeah, so 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 for uh, so for for launch, for example, um, um, rockets are primarily powered with uh, cryogenic fuels that, that are kept super cold. And that um, uh, makes the, the ground systems required to fuel a rocket very complex. Uh, and so that goes out the door with our fuel. Also, um, uh, the, um, our, compared to like hydrazine, for example, that's used to power uh, satellites, uh, hydrazine is really expensive and it's only sold by the government. Uh, our fuel can be, you can, you can uh, buy it publicly, I mean, uh, you know, uh, openly. And, um, and, and the, the the fuel itself, it, it's at a fraction of the cost of, um, say, hydrazine. So it's low cost, uh, and then once you um, once you're operating, let's say, a satellite, the power consumption, the power required to run it, is very low. It's highly responsive, high performing. Um, it, it can be. Here's, here's another thing. Another thing. It's it's throttleable and it's restartable, and that is very very critical when you're in space and you you want you need to be able to um, manage the thrust a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, and and just to be clear, is your is this for like terrestrial to orbital launch, or is it for moving around when you're in space? The 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 fuel or both? So yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because um, yeah, it's um, it, it yeah our fuel actually it um, our fuel can power rockets for launch, 
and it can we can develop uh, variations of the of the mixture uh, to power a spacecraft in space. Uh, so it's so it's for both. Yeah, just yeah, uh, both. Yeah, just it, variations. Yeah. 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 And talk to us about what you see as the demand for door to door taxi service to space. So, so overall, the, um, the 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 space launch market uh, is currently at about um, what is it like around 10, 10, you know, over ten billion dollars. I think it's approaching fifteen billion dollars already, and uh, it's uh, projected to reach uh, to approach fifty billion dollars in uh, uh, by twenty thirty. Now, uh, well, that's the entire launch market. But then, when it comes to uh, the uh, this uh, door to door taxi taxi service, uh, so. Let's just say that there are only like one or two launch facilities um, like here in the U.S. and and even around the world, there there are only a handful. Especially with uh, with Na with uh, Russia, not really wanting to do business with uh, the U.S. anymore, and then China, <laughs> not, not our buddies. <laughs> because yes. of, because of that, we have we have uh, we have, we uh, there are only um, a, a couple of um, places that where you can ro launch rockets from, and uh, so at this point, it, SpaceX pretty much has. Uh, you know, a grip on the on the launch market, and they have a massive backlog of um, of launches. What that means is that all these uh, uh, only the um, uh, like all, all these uh, universities around the world, uh, uh, commercial companies, uh, startups that are, that want to launch their um, uh, their satellite to space, uh, they they have to wait. They have to wait like two years, uh, or, or they have to pay. Um, uh, like ten times more, actually eight eight times more to launch with Rocket Lab. That's another option, uh, but uh, that's how it is. And and uh, the other thing is that um, is that a lot of the um, uh, foreign uh, customers uh, they they have a, a a very tough time trying to ship their uh, their satellites to the U.S. to be launched uh, because their satellites have like uh, have Russian parts. I'm sorry, uh, Chinese parts, and there there are some issues with that. Um, yeah, so so there's a big demand for for being able to launch from different different parts around the world. Yeah, yeah. So another thing that I'd like to add here uh, is that uh, as we are as we are developing our launch vehicle, we real we are realizing that uh, we can um, uh, we can modify our upper stage to or uh, to um, to offer uh, re-entry capabilities. Basically, we'll be able to take payload up to uh, low Earth orbit. And then we'll be able to pick up a uh, new payload up there and bring it bring it right back, uh, you know, very quickly. And that right there, that has been um, that that's a uh, we've well when we talked to our customers about that, we the the interest was just huge. They were like jumping around <laughs> because uh, it takes months uh, to schedule a a, launch, a return launch from space and being able to go up and down very quickly that would enable. Um, Manufacturing and lower yep. orbit, and um, you know R and D, all kinds, all kinds of stuff. Yep. yep, and I have a lot more questions than we have time for for this one because sure. I'm fascinated by it. But just just one last one. Sure. The, the return technology. That's your technology, or you're saying other people are developing the the technology? Well, that's that's our technology. So you you have technology to bring stuff back without it burning up. Well, we have we, we have, so we can use our rocket basically to go up and down. Awesome. Very cool. Let's, yeah, let's catch up more. This is really interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic job, Miguel. Well, that wraps up our pitches for today. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And a huge thank you to Matt, uh, as well as our sponsor, Brex. If you're going to be in Austin, Texas this Friday, come to our in-person demo day where you can meet all of these guys, plus one more company we invested in who wasn't able to make it here today. Uh, you can meet the founders in person, ask them more questions. Um, it'll be a great time. So that's 3 p.m. CST at Wanderlust on East 7th Street. If you'd like to get in touch with our team, you can email me at katie at draperstartupcost.com or visit our website at dshaccelerator.com. Um, and before we go, Matt, any last things that you want to say for anyone listening? Nope. Start awesome. Off. Awesome. Awesome group. Uh, really good job all around. And I'm, uh, you guys are doing great. So thanks for including me. And in all, all four of those companies were really interesting. Great work. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, hopefully we'll see you guys on Friday. Thanks for coming. See you guys.